Joseph Bacon, in his Wisdom of the Ancients, interpreted a great many of the Greek myths in terms of psychopolitical statements of principles of universal procedure. He did not, however, include in his group the myth of Dionysus, and that is the one we'd like to think about for just a few minutes as a prologue to the present problem. According to the old legends and myths, Dionysus was the beloved son of Zeus, father of heaven. He was born of a mortal woman and became a deity. Actually, Zeus was a doting father. He was really given to spoiling his only son, whom he loved devoutly and dearly. And to keep the little fellow happy when he was quite small, his father presented him with every kind of a toy that could be conceived of. They gave, he gave him all kinds of things. Of course, he didn't have to give him a space suit. He had that already. But he did have, uh, I guess, video games or their equivalents. He had building blocks, alphabets, numbers, all kinds of things from puzzles to solve. And he was really surrounded by every type of challenge that Zeus could bestow. And Zeus stood by and watched the little one enjoying all of this, you might say, educational amusement. But one day, in the course of time, the little Dionysus, wandering around in his father's home in Olympus, wandered too close to the edge, and there appear upon the scene twelve titans, giants, uh, very unpleasant characters, who found it a wonderful opportunity to steal away the little boy. So, when Zeus was concerned with managing the universe, the titans kidnapped the little Dionysus and killed him. Now, this became the basis of a, a very great and lengthy fable, which was carried on through into the initiation rites of the Bacchic mysteries and became the peculiar property of the Dionysian artifices, the great system of ancient architectural engineering. Now, let's think for just for a moment to see what this might all mean in terms of our present way of life. Actually, we are all, in a sense, like the little Dionysus. We have all been given a vast number of toys in the course of our evolution. We have been given almost everything conceivable to educate and amuse us. We have been given all kinds of studies. We have been given all kinds of animals to be friendly with. We have found a world of beauty and of peace and of happiness where everything was unusual, everything was interesting, and the human being had very largely the control of this wonderful sphere of entertainment and amusement. But something went wrong. And the thing that went wrong, apparently, was that the Titans got mixed up in the picture. And as the little boy, wandering in the heavenly world, came too close, the primordial elements took hold of him and dragged him down into mortality. Therefore, we find in the legend that all of the good things that were given to us have been spoiled by degradation, by being profaned, by being turned over to the keeping and the tender mercy of chaos. And today, chaos is a word we're all beginning to be afraid of, more perhaps than we ever were in the time of the Greek legends. The truth of the matter is that, as most sacred books tell us, this world was a very pleasant place the way it was intended to be. It was created with a mysterious but wonderful power of self-replenishment. It could go on and on and on. It was a self-sustaining, self-complete mass in space. It had everything we needed. 
everything that we really should learn to enjoy. It was full of opportunities not only for improvement, but for play, for joy, for friendliness, and for entertaining our unfolding minds. The world around us is a mass of educational toys. Now, we may say that toy might not be an appropriate word for these different things, but from the standpoint of the divine power, a toy is appropriate, inasmuch as all these things that we see and have are physical. We have been given the multiplication table, and we can have fun with that forever. We have been given the alphabet, not in the form of little blocks, but in the form of an infinite expanse of living procedures in nature, providing us with a basic form of communication. We have languages. We have all these things which are the toys of the gods. They are the powers which divinity can scatter at will over the vast space of the created universe. Somewhere along the way, however, these things cease to be toys. And to follow Bacon's psychopolitical thinking, these things became the subjects of envy, jealousy, cupidity, and burglary. Each person now wanted other people's toys. And instead of enjoying these things, which all have free regardless, human ingenuity began to find ways to take the freedom away from them. Instead of all these things being available to the creation, uh, they were locked up in little segments, and people were made proprietors over them. And in a short time, it was necessary to make a great effort to get at these supplies that nature gave us. For everything we see, everything we know in the material universe is like the air and the water. It belongs to all things. But in the course of time, we have asserted proprietorship over these things. And when somebody wanted somebody else's toys, they didn't hesitate for a moment to steal them. And if the individual didn't like the idea of having them stolen, it was all right to kill him and take them anyway. So gradually, the universe, as it was intended to be, the universe of a tremendous school with a great playground, gradually descended into the confusion and complexity that we know today. And most of the fun, joy, and even the enlightenment has been taken out of these various possessions. We no longer really study to find out what these things mean that have been given to us. We take them for granted, use them as we please, and abuse them if we want to, and then wonder why things do not go well. So in this idea, we are at the present time suffering from a lot of broken toys. Toys that we've broken with our own callousness, with our own selfishness, with our own avarice. Toys that we have thrown away when they were perfectly good and could have been used for a much longer time. Everything that has come down to us is no longer regarded as a gift of divinity. It is attributed now to some corporation that manufactures them. It never has been revived in the human mind that the essential things that we have never did belong to us, never belonged to any person, but were the gifts of a divine power that expected them to be used wisely. Little by little, therefore, our toys became more expensive and various manufacturers made them poorly, and fashions changed so rapidly, and the whole idea of what should have been a great educational spectacle for human good simply settled down to a good, solid, business, economic, industrial foundation. Now, this is only one side of the problem, because in the processes of living with a civilization that no longer cares for value, we find a great many people desperately hurt. We all naturally, I think, like to be constructive. We all want to do nice things. We all want to have constructive beliefs. We all want something to care for, something to love, 
something to hope for and things to build on. We are that kind of a creature. And gradually this intensification that is taking place around us has swept away all of these values. One by one, every ideal that we have has been perverted and corrupted. And therefore we may say that human hopes, human ideals, human dreams, man's great desire to do nice things, his vision of better times and better conditions, have all been betrayed, and he finds that he is actually almost alone, very unhappy, deprived of every natural pleasure that he uh, normally could use, and he is like the little Dionysus who has been gradually brought to the edge of the divine world and is being assailed by the in uh, placable hatreds of the titans so that the human being today has gradually been driven into a mysterious underworld of machines of physical processes of discoveries of nuclear weapons of all kinds of destructive misuses of the natural resources with which he has been provided as a result of that the broken doll really represents man's entire concept of the reason for himself. He is disillusioned. The hopes that he believed to be his natural birthright have faded away. And that which he hoped would become part of a beautiful and wonderful life has been swept out of his reach by ulterior motives and conspiracies. Out of this type of thing, and this type of problem, therefore, it is necessary to more or less go back to Neoplatonism or one of the other classical schools to see what the answer and the reason for all this can possibly be. There has to be a reason for everything. The universe is under laws and even great Zeus must obey them. Therefore, what is it that is happening that can really make things better for all of us and help us to regain our faith in the beautiful and the good, and become, as the little Dionysus was, a child of heaven, instead of a groping elder person wandering in the darkness of earth. Well, there are lots of things that we can think about in this particular situation. We must realize, and do realize, that things have a meaning. We also realize that the Bible said that there would never be another deluge that the world would not be destroyed again. This is consoling in the presence of nuclear armament. But there is probably a greater truth underlying some of the older beliefs than we realize or accept today. Today we are disillusioned, sophisticated, and embittered. But beneath the surface of this type of attitude, there are still tremendous hopes, tremendous strengths of belief, that we are still actually in a position to control our own destiny. So we have to begin to see what constituted this world of toys that we have been given. Well, you can write, read a book on almost any form of life, anthropology, zoology, even all the way down to bacteriology, and find out the number of creatures and the number of things that exist on Earth. Our television programs now often include uh, nature studies in which we become suddenly aware of an incredible diversity of life. And as we sit down and watch this on the screen, perhaps without reasoning, reasoning about it at the time, we are actually seeing the one of the or group of these toys. We are seeing things that are around us that are worth knowing and which most of us have never contacted. So there we begin to see an educational dimension in the forms of life that are gradually being brought to our attention. Then we have all kinds of processes, all the uh, forms of science, medicine, art, literature. We have astronomy and physics. We have every type of tremendous reservoir of potential possibilities. And with a strange negative attitude, we are definitely wasting and casting aside these uh, 
processes, these wonders that should be given to us. Our education doesn't make anything wonderful. Education is largely making us accept the inferior meaning of things. It provides only the most literal explanation of everything that happens. It does nothing at all to save the broken doll or mend it or get us a new one. It simply should take away from us, according to its own thinking, the fact that the doll is of any importance at all. These things must go to face the great maturity of, we might almost say, disillusionment. So, so into the face of this type of thing, it's probably necessary to find out just what kind of a world we are living in. This planet, we are all beginning to realize, is a rather tight-fitting organization. It's getting too small for us every day. We are, however, here. And this planet has the most extraordinary diversity of wonders going on in and around it every moment. It is simply a mass of laws moving into manifestation. It is an immense, immense number of processes maintaining an infinite diversity of life. Man wanders around in a universe of life and still he believes in death. He has never been able to really find the clue to the interpretation of the world around him, and he has never been really able to play constructively with the toys of the gods, which are the wonders of natural existence. Yet there are people who are beginning to think more and more about this. They are beginning to want to change the perspective of the person toward his environment. Instead of being a great person, in a miserable environment, we are beginning to realize that too many folks these days are little wretched persons in an incredible environment which we have failed to understand. We have not done very much to fill our time with the usefulness that would have brought us a great deal more peace and happiness. Now we sit by the hour in front of a television watching things that are not true, explained by people who do not understand them, <laughs> and at the same time taking away step by step what little hope we have left in anything. This we consider to be the proper use. Now let us assume for a moment that the infinite Zeus and his mighty throne decided the television would be an interesting thing for humanity to have. There would be an opportunity to get a great big look at realities. But, as usual, the Titans moved in, and now it is just another instrument of unreality. Yet the, the potential is there. The printing press is a potential for immediate and inevitable growth. Most of it is now wasted. And people faced with all these things feel that the, the use of life has been taken away. They feel frustrated, lost, lonely, tired. And the wonderful dreams they had as children when they really played with these toys correctly are all gone. And maturity is a great headache, a great area in which we are abusing everything we ever knew or ever had. So we have to begin to think this through, and one of the ways the Greeks did it, certainly, is the Neoplatonists of Alexandria, who were among the best of our mystic thinkers of all time. They realized that we have never divided between materiality and spirituality. We have never seen this universe as anything but a mass of matter. We have never really understood it, except that it is some kind of a molehill floating in space, and that everything that happens, happens here, and every hope we have is centered here, and everything we believe must be according to here, and nothing else. So, as a result of this attitude, as here gets more and more uncomfortable, we become more and more disillusioned. We have not learned to realize that the universe itself is a vast toy, a tremendous wonder in space, 
with astronomers all around looking through telescopes to try to find out what is inside or behind a black hole. They may find out, but the wonder of it goes on and on and on. We live in a universe of wonders. Children live in that kind of a universe of wonder, but they live it honestly. We are living in a world of wonders, but we are living more or less dishonestly, because we don't even bother to look for the wonders unless we think we can incorporate them in something and make a profit. All of this is tiresome, and it is really affecting human beings more than we realize. We must begin to give the individual some concept of the world of his own childhood, made mature, made real, made adult, but still left beautiful. And there's no reason it cannot be this way. The only reason is that a few ambitious human beings have set up structures which it is difficult for average persons to overcome or correct in their own natures. Actually, we should realize, as the Greeks did, that this world that we are living in now is not a world that we are intended to stay in. This is not the universal fulfillment. This is the little red schoolhouse just outside of one of the ordinary orbits of the planets. Each planet is a schoolhouse of some kind. And here on earth, we are here for one purpose, and that is to learn something. And if there was nothing to do with the learning after we got it, it is rather reasonable the universe would not have conferred the ability to get it. We are only able to grow because growth is important. We are only able to transcend our own weaknesses because transcendence is important. And transcendence is not measured in the journey from the cradle to the cemetery. So we have here a world that is really an educational toy. That's exactly what it is. It's here for us to learn to be better by having fun, by enjoying the wonders of the natural world, by understanding the larger cosmic purpose by seeing it working out in the daily experiences of living things. We are not supposed to lose faith in the invisible or the wonderful or the beautiful. We are not supposed to decide in our own minds that the good fairy is a delusion. We are here to find the universal good as it is ours, as it was intended to be, and as it still is except that our own thinking, imagination, and corruption has destroyed our privilege to see it. We are still working with a world that is beautiful and always will be. If that's true, then where is the trouble? Well, the trouble is largely in ourselves. The individual has not reacted as he might have. He has not learned to grow as he should have. One of the things he should learn from his experience here is that there is a kind of growth dimension with which we all have to cope. We are not here on a line, on a level between the cradle and the grave. We are on an ascending arc. There is some reason why every living thing should in some way be better when it leaves here than when it got here. And today it's apt to be the opposite. But actually a lifetime is a period of growth. And the universe has set it up so this growth is for the most part pleasant and relatively easy. It is man that has made it unpleasant and very difficult. So we have to start in to see what we can do with this world as we find it. One thing we can all remember, as people often say, whether they know about it or not, they wonder why they're here. They say, well, I didn't ask to come. Here I am. Well, maybe we did ask to come. Maybe we're where we wanted to be because there was something out there, some new adventure that we wanted to share in. But as body closes in upon our hopes and aspirations, and education dulls them, there is a grave disillusionment. 
Life is no longer the beautiful necessity we have thought about. It becomes a nagging, fatiguing routine. But this is not what it was meant to be, and it not was, is not what it can be if we want to do something about it. The first thing, perhaps, in the most practical level of all, is to realize it's not going to be done for us. The idea that we can all sit back until the golden age arrives, and then we'll all be better off, is not according to the common sense of the creation plan. We are, each person is here to grow as an individual. The more difficult the environment, the greater the result if he does grow. The more he overcomes, the stronger he is. The more he drifts along with things as um, may be considered the easy way, the less he is. So each person has got to solve the world for himself. He's got to restore the golden age in his own heart before he'll ever find it anywhere else. And the golden age is here. It has always been here. And no matter how much gold we've taken out of the earth or how much oil we buy from Saudi Arabia, the golden age is still here. The golden age is this intangible inner life of the individual, something that cannot be destroyed, be destroyed by nuclear fission or anything else. This inner life, which can become anything the individual wants to make it, now, in religion, we have a great many problems that come up with this type of thing. People are trying to work it out so that by a better believing, they can become better people. Well, this is in a sense true, but it is a dangerous truth we have to think about. How can we become better people first? And how can we become better people continuously under the process of growth? This is the problem we all have to face today. For example, we can say very truly uh, that if we practice certain metaphysical disciplines, if we take on certain teachings, if we believe certain truths and we read certain books, that we are going to be spiritually improved. This is only an assumption. And the evidence is very largely to the opposite when we get down to it. It is not that study makes us good. It is that goodness makes us good students. The change has to be in the individual, not in the thing he's trying to do. No matter what system he uses, he must use it with the life as he has it now. And if he is the same arrogant, proud, self-centered, conceited individual, or is out desperately hunting for an escape from boredom, there is not going to be any genuine growth anywhere in the studies that he is doing. He has to change himself first. And when he changes himself first, he has taken the first great step towards enlightenment. Enlightenment is not bestowed until it is earned, and it is not earned until the individual has corrected his own mistakes. This type of process is not very enticing. It's never been one of the world's popular beliefs, but it has become gradually recognized as the only truth behind a variety of misunderstandings. The individual has to restore the golden age in his own heart. Now, this is not as hard as it, would might, as it might seem. And while it may not solve everything, it answers a very large group of problems that we all face. There's hardly anyone who hasn't a grievance against somebody. There's hardly anyone who cannot complain that they have had a rough way along the path of life. There are very few people who do not feel that their friends have betrayed them or that children have deserted them. All of these problems are classical. They arise constantly in the relationships of human behavior. But how many of these people stop short in this type of self-pity and ask honestly and sincerely how they help these people whom they say hurt them? What was the cause of the trouble? We always want to hand it on to another person. 
If it hadn't been for them, we'd be happy. But the, the very many cases they are saying, if it hadn't been for us, they would have been happy. There was lack of common affection, lack of unselfish sharing of life. There were people, each one of whom, looked upon this world as something that they should have a special control over. That they should change other people, but remain unchanged themselves. That they should dictate to the lives of perfect strangers sometimes, but woe to anyone who tries to dictate to theirs. The same is true in religion's beliefs and so forth. There are many prejudices that pass as beliefs, and these prejudices are nearly always supported by some kind of selfishness or a kind of selfish ignorance. So we are living in a world that was created as for a race of happy children that has become corrupted and polluted by ourselves. We worry about the problem of pollution, we worry about the smog problem. We worry about the danger of nuclear warfare. We worry about scarcity as a product. We worry about everything. But we do not stop to find out what is the cause of the worry. And the worrier, if he looked carefully, would probably find himself included among those causes. He is causing it himself, but he wants to blame it on someone else. He wants to have everyone financially well-to-do, but he wants to control the finances of a business or something and make it impossible for others to have a reasonable living. All these things have added up to a loss of the great joy of life, the loss of dreams, the loss of hopes. Now, if we consider this material world and the people in it as factual, as something we can't do anything about, if we cannot change the selfish person, if we cannot correct or reform the liar, what are we going to do? Are we going to just simply mope along until death do us part? We hope not. Because regardless of what other people do to us, we can be and must be and should be the keeper of our own destiny throughout life. We can live as well as we want to live, regardless of how other people live. And the better we want to live, the happier we are going to be. And we will discover that this type of attitude also overcomes many of the inhibitions of our environment. We find that people who haven't spoken to us for a long time will speak to us if we have a better attitude toward them. If we begin to forgive other people and chastise only ourselves, we will have a gr much greater ability to win the regard, rep uh, regard, reputation, and well-being of other people. So we go to work on this problem a little bit carefully. We want to build back what Mencius called the child heart. Mencius, the great Chinese philosopher, second perhaps only to Confucius, and a very profound student of the Confucian code, was the one that pointed out, beyond all things, that the only human beings that are close to heaven are children. And we find the same thing in the scriptures, where Jesus tells them to let the children come to him, for of them is the kingdom of heaven. We are all children, we only think we've grown up. We couldn't act the way we do if we were grown up. <laughs> we are simply overgrown children. We are children, and like most children, we can be very cruel. We can be extremely critical. And we can become heartbroken over something our elders will never know when they take the doll away from us. But actually, we are all children. And it's just as wise and just as true to say that people with powerful ambitions are play playing with dangerous toys and have not yet grown up to understand the meaning of the very toys they play with. 
So we start in by taking a universal attitude that we are sophisticated youngsters that have been more or less spoiled by the indulgences of our parents and have failed to recognize the indulgence of the supreme power that put us here, a power that gave us everything necessary to do right, which we have promptly exploited and found various ways of commercializing. So we got to get back now to something uh, that we start over. Uh, we maybe, you know, have some long white hair or something by the time we get back to childhood. But the idea of a second childhood should not be held as it is today as a symbol of senility. Second childhood is probably our second chance at maturity. We have begun to get away from some of the phonies. The individual who is retired from business and is not feeling too well, but is still able to get around and do things, is in a sense emancipated. He is now capable of doing what he pleases. And if he pleases to do what is right, if he pleases to grow, he becomes again a child learner, out to find out more, out to explore and study, out to enjoy and share and to give. And instead of sitting somewhere on a bench and waiting uh, to uh, leave this world, the person should be very active, restoring the child heart. Uh, nearly all of the great teachers of the world have been represented by the heart symbol, the heart doctrine of the Buddhas, the heart doctrine of Christianity, the heart doctrine of Hinduism. These are doctrines based finally upon the heart and love. And love is, the some, is that something which is perverted is the most terrible and deadly force of all. The corruption of the human basic emotions of life are the most painful and dangerous of all corruptions. Uh, they take away from the individual a divine power uh, to survive the stress and shocks of living. Actually, if we can start in as a new group of small children, the first thing we know about children is they ask questions. And usually the parents can't answer them. So I know a number of parents who took courses in various schools in order to answer their children's questions. <coughs> And, of course, they got the standard answer. And after they'd been to the school, got the answer, and given it to the child, the child knew no more than did before. Because the answer was more childish than the child. The child was a basically straight thinker, and no one could ever straighten out the answer. So the person starting out might probably find it well to sort of stay quietly to themselves, I'm like a child, I am ignorant. What I don't know would fill volumes. But I have a clean, open heart. I have an inquiring, questing mind that has not been corrupted or spoiled. Therefore, I am capable of becoming wiser and better. Not by being over-influenced by the way other peoples are doing things, but working from inside of myself, working in a simple, direct effort to find out the things that one must know to have a good life. And if we can start in that way and kind of go straight along, not being taken to one side or other by taking on family grievances and things of this kind, but always observing and watching to see what happens to who does what, and constantly observing. As we walk along through life, we find a great many toys are educational. And one of the ways of finding this out is to watch other people playing with the same toys and see what happens to them. You can look around pretty generously these days and find that matrimony is a toy that is in serious trouble. People are making every mistake that is possible 
in the term of home building. They, we can't prevent them from making the mistake because they wouldn't care what we said to them in most cases. But we do not fa need to fail to observe the real facts and tuck those that knowledge away against the time when we may need it. And we will not do the things that these other people are doing. Everything that goes wrong is a lesson. Everything that goes right is a lesson. And the learner is inside of ourselves. And we must begin to use this knowledge constructively. These educational games, these toys that we have been given in order that we might grow, reach out beyond the human kingdom into the animal kingdom, they also are among the blades of grass, they are in the oceans and in the sky. Everywhere there are important symbols and things, things that are puzzles, things that are adventures, uh, things that are uh, matters for observation and reflection. If we begin to use some of our faculties in this way, we will also relieve the mind of this desperate burden of grievances which most folks accumulate during the course of a lifetime. The uh, problem of trying to get through this life without making an enemy is not easy. And it may be that under certain occasions it's practically impossible. But there is a great deal of animosity that could be cured by one kind word and we will not speak it. Or the other one won't speak it. And gradually we become isolated, wrapped up in little attitudes of our own as tight as a caterpillar in a cocoon. We just will not let anything come through. Also, by watching carefully this as a child, we can begin to sense that there's something else about the whole business. For it says in the, med in the legend of Dionysus that when uh, the little boy was devoured by the giants, that they tried to hide the crime by b burning uh, that part of the body which they could not consume. And the smoke of the fire reached Zeus, and he sent a thunderbolt and slew the giants. Then he took the ashes of his little son, and uh, the ashes of the titans who had devoured part of the child, and he fashioned out of this the first human being who therefore had a body of a titan and a soul of Dionysus. Part of the child. And he fashioned out of this the first human being, who therefore had a body of a titan and a soul of of Dionysus. There was a conflict set up between order and chaos within the individual himself. His inner life is order, his outer life is chaos. And if the inner order is polluted or diluted and falls into the keeping of the chaos, all is lost. There is in every living thing a, a mysterious power derived from deity which power is capable of bringing the person out of his difficulties and bringing him back again into the patterns of the divine purpose. It is in every living thing. It is not limited to man. It is limited only to that which has a form of any kind, because what is not, which has not a form is, cannot be ensouled, because a soul must dwell in a form. But it may be an invisible form, but it is still there. So in every form, blades of grass, the earth under our feet, the waves of the sea, in everything that exists, there is soul. For soul is that which makes for a form possible. A form without soul is matter only. And it is inconceivable that we will ever find pure matter for soul 
It goes into form in every level of existence. Now, the purpose of soul always, as Bamey pointed out, is to use the form which it has, much as it uses the acorn. The form becomes the food of the soul. And through this, the soul is released into growth to grow into a mighty tree, many times the size of the acorn. So every soul has within it this growing factor, growing through body, growing up to a release of itself into the light of truth. Well, people don't seem to pay much attention to souls anymore. They just take for granted that they have an animation somewhere, that there is something in them that lives that makes it possible for them to make mistakes. They don't know what it is. They have no idea what the power of mot motivation behind them. They do not what know what it is that forces creatures to break through the shells of matter and grow, which may enable very primitive creatures to maintain the stream of life and to develop more and more purposeful existences. But actually, regardless of how we approach the matter, the individual has within himself this compound of the blood of the dying God, the Christ in you, the hope of glory, and the Titans, or the primordial, uncultivated, undisciplined attitudes and emotions. And whenever anything happens around, we generally let either the mental or the emotional titans take over. They become more or less giants without soul, without consciousness, without true purpose. They are primordial force and energy. The kind of force that gets behind you uh, when you reach out and strike somebody you do not like. The f power to hit another person is the energy of the titans. And when the power of the soul is blighted by this antagonism, the blow is struck, and the soul remains a prisoner for another period of time, whereas forgiveness would have released the soul and baffled the titans. So everywhere in us is conflict. St. Augustine pointed this out in his story of the city of God and the city of Babylon. We are a double empire, each of us. One part, as Goethe says, in Faust, to the heavens aspires, and the other in the earth suspires. There is conflict in all of us until we mend that conflict by the power of our own inner lives. When soul attains victory, confusion ends. When body gains victory, confusion is worse confounded. So we have to constantly labor uh, to make this adjustment and the uh, way to make it is to realize that we have to cut clear through an entire world of sophistication. We have to cut through what we like to think of as the grown-up practical world. A world that is growing up, but it's also growing older, so that all the grown-ups will ultimately disappear without being very wise in most cases. We are mistaking a material environment with its classical opportunities, with its skyscrapers, with its tremendous aviations, with its factories and its various colossal industries, we mistake this for something important. Yet uh, not long ago, one of the science editors here in this country uh, said that if by some chance we do get into a nuclear war, there won't be anything left anyway. And yet we consider this world with its very tr tragically impermanent things and the attitude of people who are making every possible effort to destroy what there is. This is not a world that is ours. This is not a world we can afford to become involved in more than is necessary. We are here not because it is going to be our share to be wealthy or to lead an army to conquer a nation or to use our own arrogance to cause millions of deaths on a battlefield. This is not our purpose. Our purpose, as far as we can make it, is to realize 
that we are here to experience and that all true experience makes us more kind, more generous, more simple, and more true to the divine plan of things. Thus it is that religion has come to be considered almost as the actual voice of the soul in human affairs. It is that part of the soul's philosophy which has been already established in man in defiance of the pressures of materialism. You can see it, the war going on now between Dionysus and the Titans, the struggle of industrialism, of materialistic philosophy and policy against that part of man's nature which wants to believe in the beautiful and the good. We see nation after nation and individual after individual sacrificing everything, including life, to preserve the principles that to them are more important than living. So with each of these things in our mind, we can sit back and look a little bit. We can go to work and try and see what we can find out that will help us uh, to escape from this treadmill that we have created for ourselves. And when we do it, we will become again as little children. And we will know the meaning of the words that blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We shall find gradually that what we call growing up in materialism was a false growth, a delusion. We have not grown up, we have simply grown old. We have not grown wiser, we have become more skillful and therefore more dangerous. The great values have not been nursed. We are still vain. We still try to save the weakness of the inside by polishing the outside. We are still believing that appearance is everything. We are still trying to get ahead in a world which will never get anywhere in the long run. But they, we hope, or many people hope, that it will be here long enough for them to build their little careers before the big career falls apart. This type of thinking is hard on individuals. It's hard on ourselves, it's hard on our families, it's hard on our communities, and it is fatal to our political electional system because we elect what we think will do the most to keep our own material interests alive. So out of all of this, we can start right on back and decide more or less as Socrates did and also Diogenes that uh, we just got off on the wrong foot. We got off somewhere when the caveman began to throw rocks at each other. Then his trouble began. And from that time on, the world has been divided into a vast majority of people who believe propaganda, and a few who do not. And the few who do not are the ones that must gradually become the leaders of human thought. They must be the ones who can transcend the common selfish self-centeredness uh, by which we are all suffering keenly, whether we realize it or not. Actually, therefore, we need our toys back. We need the joy of simple living. A lot of people try to go back to nature. Every once in a while, one of our friends comes in and says, Well, I'm, I'm going back. I'm going up in the wilderness. I'm going to stake out 15 acres, and I'm going to live there in peace the rest of my life. Well, everybody wishes them well and pats them on the back and hopes the taxes won't force them out of it anyway. And about a, month, a year later, the fellow's back. He said, I couldn't stay any longer up there. I was going crazy. Why were you going crazy? Because there wasn't anyone to talk to. There wasn't anyone to do anything with. I didn't even get news. And uh, before it was all over, they moved back here because they were dependent on a diet of misinformation. They were dependent upon the opinions of people who knew no more than they did, and sometimes less. And they were also deprived, finally, from the ability to complain about things as they are. <laughs> With therefore nothing left to do, they had to come back and take on the heavy burden that they thought they were going to give up. Now, this happens in every life. When we start to try and 
think better, live better, rise above conditions, we do find uh, that it requires a considerable adjustment in ourselves. And time has proven more and more that this adjustment is best when you do not walk out on humanity. Uh, the, uh, the moment you go off by yourself with the birds and the bees, you are not able to face the challenge of living. You're not going to learn much anymore. You're going to rusticate. You're going to settle back and just simply wait for the gradual disintegration of your vehicles. There's nothing much to do. Well, if you were back in the world fighting out something you believe in and changing your own life to meet the principles you hold to be true, you'd have a reason for existence. We have no reason for existence except the need for growth. And if we artificially block that need, then life again becomes meaningless. Everything depends upon man's personal adjustment with the problems which concern him most. So we watch a little bit and we observe that the, both the Oriental and the Occidental mystic, uh, both of them have developed the, what is probably the best answer to it all. They have decided simply to ignore the Titans. They are going to not have any more dealings with those nasty giants who are always making trouble. And they are doing it by gradually quieting the titanic factor in themselves. And this is done by various meditational exercises, by mystical attitudes, by prayer, and by a gradual increase of understanding about life. They find it's the only answer to get rid of this confusion is to wipe the slate clean of everything that is difficult or dangerous to our own survival. Now we can say, well, you can't do that entirely. How am I going to forget the fact that my husband went off with another woman? How are we going to do this? Well, you'll have to do it sometime, even if it takes death to do it. You will also have to realize that you are perpetuating a tragedy in yourself when something has been closed and sealed off by circumstances that are no longer to be changed. Therefore, you've got to get rid of the thinking that is constantly tying you back uh, to the level of life which you want to escape from. If you want to compete, you can compete, but you can never have a life that is free from competition that way. If you want to dislike people, you can dislike them. But you will never grow any higher in your understanding as long as the dislike remains. If you want to blame others for your misfortunes, you can do so. But as long as you do that, your own growth cannot develop. The idea that a philosophy will take away all of these defects of character is foolish. Because you can meet on the street almost any day an individual with very high convictions who is living miserably because they have never lived their own convictions and have defended their position on the grounds that other people were responsible for their misfortunes. So you have to start in uh, by building a new pattern. And one way, of course, you can gain something for this is trying to understand a little better things you have taken for granted. Try to go back as Pythagoras taught and see if you can really find the reason for a difficulty that has plagued you for half a lifetime. See who was really to blame. And if the person was to blame, how much of the spirit of forgiveness did you use? Yeah, you are told in the scriptures to forgive your enemies. How many do this? Not too many. But no one who hasn't forgiven an enemy can grow any further. Those problems that hurt and destroy character must be solved before a person can go on. I think we can explain this in something that is happening today, which is rather sad and disappointing in a sense, and that is that there has been a tremendous increase in religious awareness. 
people have moving into hundreds of different groups and sects, all of which are supposed to assist the person to uh, grow. Uh, usually, in either mystical or psychical terms. Many of these sects really overdo it a little bit, for they promise that the individual who joins them can will grow. But no group can promise growth to a person who will not outgrow his own weaknesses. No organization can bestow a formula or a belief that can overcome selfishness in your own heart. And you cannot go on to the higher until you have conquered the lower. Otherwise, you're going to get into these complications that come to me so often. The individual trying to be more than they are, bound to the lower by a whole mass of tangled attitudes, and at the same time trying to soar off to Nirvana. It just won't work. And anyone who thinks it will work is in for a very serious disappointment. Illumination does not correct your mistakes. Illumination comes to you when you have corrected them yourself and have outgrown the weaknesses by which you are bound to the level of consciousness that you at present occupy. As you grow and overcome things, your horizons broaden. The light grows stronger. As you ca if you cast off the ballast of your own mistakes, you rise in higher atmosphere. Little by little, the very correcting of your mistakes opens the way to enlightenment. But there can be no enlightenment conferred without dedication to principles. And dedication means not acceptance, but living those principles in your own daily relationships with other people. So try to get firmly fixed that you should more or less clean the slate, get back to basics, get back to foundations, and begin to build beauty. Begin to build a world of gracious things that you hope you will sometime live to see. A little girl having a doll finds it a great help in many respects. Finds it in, in it a companionship that no earthly person can give. This child gives this do toy uh, a life, makes it real. It knows the body is made of sawdust, but this doesn't affect the fact that to the child the symbol is that of friendship, of association, of intimacy. The child taking that little doll to bed isn't afraid of the dark anymore. It is something that becomes a symbol of a relationship with other things besides self. A relationship that has not yet been touched uh, by selfishness. And then suddenly, maybe, for one reason or another, the doll gets broken. And it is broken in most cases, because ultimately the doll symbol is wiped out by the so-called factual symbol. Instead of a world of little dolls that love us, we arrive in a world of all kinds of people who just really want to impose on us or do various things to hurt us. But at the same time, it is much better that we have somewhere this concept of friendship and reality. For the Christian, the infant Jesus is the forever toy. It represents the noblest, most idealistic, most sacred of all infancy. It represents the true meaning of the love of God. It represents the true meaning of the birth of a being in whose love we all share. Therefore, it is a toy in a sense, but it is a divine toy. It is a toy that reminds us of the real beauties of existence. It is a toy that ennobles us and gives us a foundation in the wonder of the infancy of the Lord. This type of thinking helps, but it doesn't do it all. It can't take the place of action. But this type of toy and its effect upon consciousness does affect action. 
it helps us to strengthen the ideal of the moment when problems arise. The, the presence of the great world teachers in their various philosophies and teachings are moral supports in time of doubt and trouble. They will help us to make no, fewer mistakes. They will prevent us from corrupting whatever virtues we have left. And in time, through the advancement of these improvements, we see our way. Buddha on one occasion said that he could take a person by the hand and he could lead them. But he could lead them only one step. But that was all that was necessary. If the individual corrects one fault thoroughly, if he overcomes one fragment of ignorance completely, if he dominates one negative attitude in himself just once, as the result of the teachings of the, of the Buddha, if from those teachings he has one little experience of the blessedness of kindness and friendship, he is already, has already taken the first step. And from that time on, he should by all means simply listen to his own heart. He will enjoy what he has done and will have the courage to do more. From the one good deed, he will get the key to the entire future and destiny of his own universal existence. So in each of these symbols, we have a, a toy in a sense, but it is a, a magnificent symbol of something we all want to try to be or to do. It is an advancement that is of the realest part of ourselves. So actually, all of these symbols come to us as, a, as an invitation to correct our own mistakes. To just settle down each day, each month, each year, to, to search for that which is good. This is also another phase of the effect of these attitudes upon the magnetic field of the body itself. Wherever the individual lowers his level of understanding and insight, even temporarily, the light in him shines less brightly. The magnetic field is disturbed by every attitude that we have, and it recognizes only two kinds of attitudes, good and bad. It doesn't recognize uh, righteous indignation any better than it recognizes unrighteous uh, um, navigation. It does not take attempt or make use of any negative except that that negative damages the magnetic field. It is damaged whenever a destructive attitude is nursed, where criticism, condemnation, and constant antagonism arises, where these arise in the person. His own health is endangered. No individual with a negative mental attitude is truly healthy. He gets along sometimes because the body perseveres. But he is not healthy unless his thoughts are ideal and beautiful. And if he wants to have at least a decent span in this world, he must learn to recognize and accept the constructive aspects of the problems he faces every day. If he does not accept them constructively, he is damaging himself. A neurotic is simply a person who takes the wrong attitude on a number of subjects. A uh, lot long ago, a psychologist had a rather in an interesting definition of this type of thing. He had a definition to divide a psychotic from a neurotic. According to he, him, a neurotic is a person who says two and two equals five. And he will go to a practitioner to years to find out that that's true. Whereas a psychotic uh, says two and two are four, and I just can't stand it any longer. <laughs> so the problem uh, is all of attitude. It is, again, just the attitude of the person. And uh, you watch people around you, especially those whom you care for and you wish good for, particularly. 
And you see these people relentlessly destroying themselves. You try to talk to them and they won't listen. And if they do listen, they disagree. And if they agree, they do nothing about it. They will not accept the fact that the fault is in themselves. So this is the first thing we have to drive home with everything we've got. Some may say, well, we might overdo it. There might be a few faults in other people that we have a right to resent. Well, there probably are faults in other people, but this can never be used as an excuse for one in ourselves. Because if we use that kind of an excuse, we'll never get any better. There are too many people with too many faults. So we have to t reserve judgment and keep on working for the things we believe to be true. We have to realize that this material world is only a shadow of reality. That it is only a comparatively impermanent testing ground for souls. It is a place where we all have to learn how to become citizens of eternity. Every living thing has a destiny beyond its present state. What that destiny is going to be, we do not know at this time. A few may suspect, but they do not know. But every individual living thing, from a gnat in a sunbeam to the largest sun or solar complex, has a future destiny. It is going somewhere. It has come from somewhere. And it's on the way. Because of this type of realization, we have to try in every way that we can to make sure that we are on the way to that which is the next for ourselves. And uh, I think we can tell pretty well that from how that goes, because every once in a while we see people, we see conditions in which good things do dominate. Every day we find there are unselfish people. Every time we read a newspaper, we may find there is selfishness, but we will also find heroic stories of people who have sacrificed everything for the common good. Everywhere there are things to admire, and the thing we want to do, if possible, is to become one of those admirable things. We want to be something that we can admire in ourselves. We want to rise above all of the delusions and confusions that have made life miserable. Actually, also, this quest for reality is probably the most perfect way of solving the problems of society as we know them today. The well-integrated person is not in debt. The thoughtful individual lives within their means. The kindly, well-intentioned, and wise person does not defraud others. All of the troubles that we have result from people who are breaking the rules of life. If we break the rules, we will have the same troubles. If we keep the rules, the rules we keep will keep us. And it's very important to realize this right away and every day. We are coming again and still into very troublesome and very critical periods in world history. We are coming to a time when integrities are going to be the most important thing in the whole world. We are going to be able to survive only because of what we do right. And we must do enough right to guarantee survival. But the good book tells us, of course, that though thousands fall on the right hand and thousands on the left, the just person shall not be moved. There is no way in which a person who has the insights and lives according to them can be destroyed. No event can destroy the just person. He can only be destroyed by injustice in himself, and if it isn't there, he cannot be destroyed. This does not mean that he cannot be taken out of his present physical body. But this, in turn, would happen to him anyway in the course of time. His life may be shortened by his cons consecrations or by his mistakes. But the individual who is right is a citizen of a universe that is right. And the good citizen is the final inhabitant of the divine plan of things. 
what Buddha calls the cosmic uh, scope or the great cosmic system, the communal system of the universe is a world in which the citizens are those who have kept the rules. And they go on to the destiny that is theirs through the millions of years, if necessary, or whatever it is, that takes them to the time that they have awaited. There is no loss of a good deed. There is nothing to be gained by a bad one. Actually, we must keep all these opportunities and keep them clean. We must use all of our abilities to cherish and protect that which is good. We must love the beautiful. We must cherish that which is gentle and kind in itself. We must also recognize and protect the imagery of virtue wherever it appears. And we have to realize that it is our power, somewhere along the line, to bring life into things that we have learned to love. That, too, can come. For man is in the way to become a creator, a creator not only of problems, but a creator of solutions. So all this wonderful nursery in which we are, where we're all playing with something, where we're all imperfect, and where we are all hoping to get a little wiser, there is an abs absolute wonder of opportunity for people to help each other, to help each other to go along the right way, to make sure that we do not tempt people beyond their capacities, that we do not do things to them that cause us to resent, that causes them to resent us. That we try our best to live according to rules that are right and proper. If we do this, there's no doubt in the world that it's going to be a lot easier for everybody. And uh, every religion has taught this. Every person who says, I am a religious person, has heard this, whether he's done anything about it or not. And uh, today we have somewhat over a billion Christians, all of whom know the words of the Sermon on the Mount. They know what they are supposed to do. They know what they're supposed to be. But they have a strange feeling in themselves that they can break these rules with impunity. Or that if they do break the rules, nothing serious is going to happen anyway. This is not according to the best thinking. Regardless of whether we are punished for breaking the rules or not, we know in ourselves we have broken them, and that is wrong. We cannot have the same dignity of life if we compromise the rules of good living. We also know that among the other religions of the world, there are probably about two and a half billion other people of other faiths who have the same basic dedications, dedications to principles. Therefore, we may say with reasonable safety that four-fifths of the population of the earth believe in right and wrong. They believe in integrities. They believe that there are powers in nature that reward the just and punish the unjust. They believe that they are part of a great system of universal love and that this love will ultimately bring them to the ends of security and reality which they seek. Yet with all that mass of people who claim to believe we cannot prevent a war. We cannot do the, anything to prevent the tremendous exploitation of human life. Somewhere there is a belief that is not working. There is a tradition, a dedication. An individual who has broken all the rules would die to defend them. It is a very strange situation, a very curious complication. But the only answer to the whole situation is to realize that we are here with the capacity to live in a beautiful world, that we are here to have all the good things happen that can happen. And we have been given a vast order of toys, playthings, by means of which we could gain educational progress. By understanding the smallest thing that exists, we share in a greater degree to all wisdom and all knowledge. 
We are living in the midst of infinite opportunity, not only to grow, but to have fun doing it. And somehow, for some reason, we seem to take all the fun out of it. We not only resent growth, we are afraid of it, and we are allowing superficial false standards to lock us into an isolation, which is causing mental and nervous illness, and is destroying the natural reasons for living. So we hope that each person will try in one way or another to pick up the tattered toys in his own life and give them new dignity, and if necessary, put a new head on the doll and take care of it carefully, because it represents a part of a heritage of symbol opportunities and has been for someone and some time a source of help in time of trouble. The sharing of our needs with real or imaginary playmates can be very important. It's when we are told that they don't exist anymore that we are in serious difficulties. So we hope you'll all believe in them at least until next time we're here two weeks from time. <laughs>